The trouble with chemotherapy or the way we treat cancer now is that we flood the body with poisonous chemicals and we all know people who've lost their hair, they're nauseated. We are hoping to develop targeted therapies that takes the drug straight into the cancer cell and thereby reduces those terrible side effects. They've done the research now to justify their claims. And I totally believe this is one of the most important breakthroughs in the cancer research area for, for as, as long as I've been associated with, uh, with, with cancer research, which is now over 20 years. The key question in the early days was whether our idea would work. To create a nanocell that would target cancer cells but leave the rest of the body unharmed. Clearly it's still pink from the dock, yeah. so we'll have to spin it down mm -hmm. and see what they look like. Our mm -hmm. first breakthrough came when we found that we could actually genetically alter bacteria to create these little nanocells. And we called this little nanocell or particle EDV, standing for Ingenic Delivery Vehicle. Yeah. Then we found that we could actually insert an anti-cancer drug directly into the EDV particle. The next step was to coat the EDV with an antibody that would recognize only cancer cells. What we hoped was that the EDV would lock onto the cancer cell and be swallowed by the cancer cell, then releasing the drug inside which would rush out and kill the cancer, much like a Trojan horse. The first time we saw it working, it was very exciting. The beginning of a day-long boat ride up Indonesia's longest river, the Kapuas. It's the only way to reach the roads and tracks that will take me deeper into the heart of Borneo. I've come to see what the impact of the decline of illegal logging and the rapid spread of oil palm plantations has had on the island of Borneo. A two-week journey to some of the most remote parts of an island shared by three countries, Malaysia, Brunei and here in Indonesia. Once all of this was dense forest. But decades of logging and clearing have left little evidence of what was once here. Now once again forests are being cleared, only this time rainforest timber is a byproduct. It's the land thereafter for oil palm. In a world hungry for power, it's a source of the alternative fuel biodiesel. Indonesia has high hopes palm oil will become the new green gold. Last year's burn-off saw more than a billion tonnes of carbon dioxide go into the atmosphere from rainforest fires set deliberately to clear new land for plantation. Deforestation is now the second greatest cause of greenhouse gas emissions after the burning of fossil fuels. It presents a dilemma that Indonesia will not be able to solve alone. How much do we destroy to save the planet? Deep in the Amazon lies the heartland of Bolivia's new ruling class. Leonida Zorita and her brother Rene are cocoleros, farmers named after their controversial crop, the coca leaf a symbol of both suffering and power. Bolivia's Indians have always used coca for ceremonial and medicinal purposes. The new government targets the sophisticated cocaine syndicates, not the coca farmers. For Leonida Zorita, the struggle continues against those who still can't quite comprehend but they're out of power. A small, mainly white, business elite. This is the other Bolivia. Five hundred kilometres to the east of La Paz, they march to a very different beat. In the city of Santa Cruz, 
Local modelling team, the Magnificas, struck their stuff. <laughs> Businessman, farmer yeah. and political activist, Carlos Rojas is proud of his city. A boom town built on agriculture and industry. And for a period during the 80s, the massive profits of the cocaine trade. There's a view among many here in Santa Cruz that their personalities are largely shaped by geography. That those living in the harsh Andes Mountains are hard, reserved, uncompromising citizens of the so-called old Bolivia. While this represents the future, the lush tropical lowlands engendering a far more relaxed, extroverted, entrepreneurial spirit. Although it has to be said, this new freewheeling economy is still very much under the control of a small privileged elite. This is my cousin Sabah. I have come here from London to pay my respects because recently Sabah's father, my uncle Kakarash, was shot dead by 86 American bullets on the streets of Kirkuk. My uncle was 75 years old and was enjoying his retirement after working all his life as a lorry driver. Khalid, a taxi driver and father of eight, was 56 years old and also shot with 86 bullets, exactly like my uncle. Majid, Khalid's only brother, has tried to contact the claims office in Kirkuk, but was disgusted with the outcome. On a tributary of the Ganges River, pilgrims gather to venerate a god. In Hindu teachings, Krishna offers solace to downtrodden women. This town has more than a chair. Thousands of women, young and old, have come to the childhood home of Krishna for one purpose, to live out their days in worship in the hope that death will come soon. She's relegated, she becomes a zero. And her, she take her, all her powers are lost. In many conservative Indian Hindu families, widows are shunned because they're seen as bringing bad luck. Superstitious relatives even blame them for their husband's death. The widow can become a liability with no social standing, an unwanted mouth to feed. Often, they're cast out of the family home. They arrive each day to the so-called city of widows, alone and penniless. As a gesture of humility, some newcomers follow the custom of shaving their head. Conservative Hindus believe a widow must never marry again. She can neither attract attention nor be attractive and must renounce all worldly pleasures. 